All right, it's Mrs. Fallon back with um, 4.5. So we are gonna talk today about a couple different theorems and um, I'm gonna show you kind of some solving and graphing and uh, all kinds of fun things today. So um, I am on page 98 of your student journals. And the only thing I wanna do on this page is actually just kind of go right to the bottom where it says the irrational conjugates theorem. It says, let f be a polynomial function with rational coefficients and let a and b re be rational numbers such that the square root of b is irrational. If a plus square root of b is zero of f, then a minus the square root of b is also a zero of f. So in normal terms, what that basically means is that if you have an irrational answer as a, a, a solution to an equation, and this is generally gonna happen when you are like solving, let's say you're solving a cubic, and um, you factor it, you get it down to like a linear and a quadratic term. You can solve the linear pretty easily. The quadratic, you may have to use the quadratic formula if it's not factorable, right? So when you use the quadratic formula, um, you're always getting, unless your discriminant's zero, you're always getting two solutions. And so basically what they're saying here is if you have an irrational number, like the square root, you can't just have, they don't come in groups of one. So you're never just going to have a number plus the square root of, a, of another number. It's always going to kind of come in pairs. And this works the same way with imaginary numbers. And the reason why is because when you have an irrational number, you know, think about like x squared uh, minus 2 equals 0, for example. Um, I am going to, uh, let's go ahead and... Yeah, let's go ahead and move the two over, and then I'm gonna square root both sides. So two is an irrational number, but because I had to solve this equation, there's always gonna be a plus and minus in front of it, which means it's not just gonna be root two, it's gonna be plus and minus root two. Same thing goes if you have an imaginary solution, right? So x squared plus two, you would get the same deal. You would have x equals plus or minus root two i. So again, they come in groups of two. Have, you can't just have one imaginary solution without having its counterpart, the positive or negative version of that. Same thing with an irrational number. And that's ultimately what this theorem is stating. All right, we are gonna actually go right into some problems. I'm just gonna kind of go through um, some, some, some problems of how to, like, how to solve some of these things and then how to graph some of these things. So I'm not going to do all of them, but I'm going to do a few, and that way give you guys kind of a, a chance to kind of see a few different kinds of solving. So this whole section is about um, is about solving, basically. And so um, when you ha have a polynomial, the first thing you want to do is go ahead, if you're going to solve it, which is what we're asking to do here, is you want to go ahead and set it equal to zero. So 20x cubed plus 80x squared plus 60x equals zero. Remember that you have some strategies. So you always wanna check, cause you can't, you don't really have any options of how to solve a cubic. So you wanna see if it's factorable. So what I notice is that first rule of factoring is to factor out a GCF. So I notice that I can factor out a 20x and I'm left with x squared plus four x plus three. Now you have a linear term and a quadratic term. The linear term you can solve. You can set 20x equal to 0 and get x equals 0. The quadratic term, you have a couple options. This is why we did those units on quadratics. You have choices here. You can factor, which is what I would do, or you could use quadratic formula, or you could use completing the square or one of the other methods, but I think it's easier to kind of go one of these routes. So I get solutions of x equals zero, x equals negative three, and x equals negative one. Remember, this was a third degree polynomial, which means that I should be looking for three total solutions. And so as long as I find three total solutions, it matches my degree, I know I'm, I'm on the right track. Um, let me show you a couple other ones. I wanna show you one where it's a trinomial with a higher power. So again, same strategy. Let's go ahead and set it equal to zero. So I'm gonna move the x to the, or the fourth to the side. What I wanna remind you on this problem is it's still a trinomial. And so you factor this the same way you factor any other trinomial. Um, I always use guess and check. I suppose you could use the AC method, but again, I kinda of wanna force you down that path of 
thinking about at least trying to do guess and check. So remember, um, you're look, thinking to yourself, what do you multiply, what two values do you multiply together to get to x to the fourth? And I know there's some options here, but in most cases, it's kind of like the same thing in both parentheses. So I'm going to go y squared and y squared. And then I'm, I'm going to look at um, numbers that multiply to 36, but add to negative 13. So multiply to positive 36, nine and, negative 9 and negative 4, but add to negative 13. That's negative 9 and negative 4. I want you to recognize here, and I know that you can solve in this case, but I did you recognize that these are also, you could factor this again. So x minus 9 can be factored into, or y squared minus 9 can be factored into y minus 3 and y plus 3. And y squared minus 2 could be y minus 2, y plus 2. And the reason why is because those were difference of two squares. So if we asked you to factor something completely, this is kind of what we're looking for. Um, since in this case we're solving, you could have just set this equal to zero and set this equal to zero. And as long as you did plus and minus um, when you solved, you, were, you would have gotten the same answer. So I've got answers of three, negative three, two, and negative two. So these are all four of my solutions. Um, it's a fourth degree polynomial, so I know I did that one correctly. All right, let me show you another example. Um, on this one, it's a four-term polynomial. So on a four-term poly polynomial, if you remember from what we talked about in class, um, so first I'm going to go ahead and set it equal to zero, so I'm going to add one. A four-term polynomial, you do factor by grouping. So my strategy is to cut that in half, so kind of split it into two and two, factor out a GCF. So I get x squared and I get 2x minus 1. There's a negative sign here, I want you to bring it down. Um, there's nothing else to factor out other than a one here. Remember when you factor, um, using factor by grouping, in order for factor by grouping to work, those two parentheses have to be the same. Um, all right, so now I get two X minus one and I get X squared minus one. Do you recognize that you could do um, difference of two squares again? So the X squared minus one could factor into X minus one X plus one just wanted to show you that. And then my solutions, if I solved that, I would get a half. If I solved that, I get one and negative one. So I have three solutions there. And remember, we had a cubic. So that's where we started. All right, I wanted to go through um, two more examples on this page. And this is more about graphing. So we're still going to actually be solving because it says find the zeros. So that, in these words, in, in layman's terms mean solve for, solve for zero, solve for x. And then you're gonna sketch a graph. So we're gonna kind of up the ante here a little bit. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this equal to zero. And so I have x to the fourth minus x cubed minus 12 x squared. So this is a trinomial, but remember my first rule of factoring, always look for a GCF. And so in this one, you might've noticed that you had an x squared in common. Now we have a quadratic term and another quadratic term. So this one is easy to solve, but I'm going to keep factoring here. I can factor this into x minus 4 and x plus 3. So when I go to solve this one, I get x to equal 0. But there's a squared on that. So remember what that means. That means that, that one's a double 0. So remember, the double zeros do something different on your graph. They bounce off your graph as opposed to a single 0. This one I get x equal 4, and this one I get x to equal negative 3. So here are my zeros. I have 0, 4, and negative 3. So it's a fourth polynomial. So because this is a double, it counts for 2. And then this is the third, and this is the fourth. All right, I'm going to go ahead and show you how I would sketch this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot all of my zeros. So I'm going to put a dot at 0. I'm going to put a little d here. And the reason why is because it's a double. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three. So those are my x-intercepts. The next thing I want to look for is my end behavior. So this is a fourth degree polynomial, which means it's even. So either both ends point up or both ends point down. Since the leading coefficient is positive, I know both ends of my function are pointing up. So now I just have to make sure I bounce off the graph here. I'm going to start here bounce off the graph here, and go through the other functions. These, alt, the, we call these um, 
minimums and maximums. We call them like local mins or global mins. And um, basically what we're getting at here is, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't actually graph this 100%, right? So I don't know how low this goes or exactly what this is. What I'm really looking for here when you graph is do you have the correct end behavior? And do you have the correct um, like middle, like what happens at the zeros? Like this one passed through, this one bounced, and this one passed through. So I'm looking to see that you're graphing that one correctly. And then I'll obviously see if that you find your solutions correctly. Let's do an odd degree one. Let's do another one. So on this one, you might notice it's four terms. So again, my first strategy is to go ahead and set this equal to zero. Just like every other four term polynomial, um, what you're gonna wanna do is do factor by grouping. So I'm gonna factor out an x squared. And then over here, I'm gonna carry down the minus sign. I'm gonna factor out a six. So again, notice that the x plus fours are in common. So I get x plus four and x squared minus six. Now x squared minus six is not a perfect like difference of two squares. So I'm gonna solve this. So I get x to equal negative four, but on this one, I'm gonna go ahead and set this equal to zero. And I'm gonna add six to both sides, and then I'm gonna square root. So remember, you're gonna put the plus and minus. And for graphing purposes, I'm gonna change this into a decimal and I get 2.5. Four, five, roughly. So root six, plus and minus root six are gonna give me plus and minus about 2.45. So in this scenario, it would make sense to go ahead and write this as a decimal rather than leaving it as a radical. All right, let's do the graph. So there are three solutions because it was a cubic. So negative four, one, two, three, four, and then negative 2.45, so one, two, about right there and positive 2.45, so I'm just gonna put my, my zeros on the graph. And then next, I'm gonna look at the end behavior. This is an odd degree and a leading coefficient's positive. So that might, means my end behavior is down then up. There are no doubles, no triples. So it looks something like this. Again, we don't know where those local mins and maxes are exactly, but we know that they're you know turning in that, in that way. Okay, let's keep going. So that's an example of kind of using a lot of factoring to solve, right? And that should always be your first strategy. Let's go to page 100. On page 100, um, we are going to uh, skip number 11. You actually, you can just cross this one out. We're gonna do number 12. So the first thing I want you to notice, it says find all real zeros, and there's one, two, three, four, five terms. We don't have a strategy for finding, um, like factoring with five terms. So when it's not factorable, the first thing you wanna do is go to your graphing calculator and type in this function. So three X to the fourth um, plus 11 X cubed oops, uh, minus 40 X squared minus 132 X and plus 48. Okay, the next thing you wanna do, and you can look at the graph if you want, um, but I wanna encourage you to look at the table. So go to second graph. What I'm looking for here are any zeros. How I can tell what a zero would be on my table is remember a zero is an x-intercept. So an x-intercept is any time that the y is zero. Notice that you have negative four right here. So I'm gonna write that down. Negative four zero is a zero. I'm gonna see if I can find any others. Scroll up for a little bit, scroll back for a little bit. It looks like I found one real zero. So what that means is I have one zero, and that's good, because I can kind of work with that. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is, now that I have one, as long as you have one zero, you can factor this using synthetic division. So this is what I mean. You found a zero, so now let's divide this, let's factor this, using synthetic division. So put the negative four over here. All of your coefficients, so three, 11, negative 40, negative 132, and 48. Remember, this is an x-intercept, right? We already guaranteed that that's an x-intercept. We saw it on our table, which means my remainder has to be zero. If it's not, you did something wrong because every x-intercept is going to be a factor of this polynomial, so it has to work. 
All right, so let's carry that down. I get negative 12. So I'm just gonna kind of go through this. Mm -mm -mm. And it works nice and pretty. So remember, we started with a quartic, so a fourth degree. I factored out one term. So what I'm left with is a cubic. So I have three x cubed minus x squared minus 36 x plus 12. So again, this was all, all of this down here is my cubic because I started with a quartic and divided out a linear. Now you have a four term polynomial. Okay, we have some strategies to be able to, to factor four term polynomials. Remember, I didn't see any other zeros on my graph or my table, so I, won't, I can't do synthetic division again. So let's try factoring. So let's cut that in half. Let's factor out an x squared. I'm going to bring down the negative and I'm going to factor out a 12. And look, it's factorable. So I get 3x minus 1 and x squared minus 12. All right, so now I'm going to solve this. So 3x minus 1, I'm going to add 1 to both sides. I get x to equal 1 third is one of my zeros. I get x squared minus 12, so I get x squared equals 12. And so I get x to equal plus or minus. Write this as a reduced radical. So that would be 2 root 3. So plus or minus 2 root 3. So here are two solutions. Here's one solution. And then don't forget about the solution we found from our table. So that accounts for all four possible solutions. This is going to be a common practice that we're going to use to kind of uh, solve unfactorable polynomials. All right. Number 13 gets into writing an equation given some of the zeros. All right, so it says a polynomial fun function of least degree has rational coefficients, a leading coefficient of one, and zeros of negative five and four plus root two. Remember what we said about this. This is an irrational solution, right? They do not come in, they're not solo. They come in groups. So that means my zeros are x equals negative five and x equals plus and minus uh, four or I wrote that wrong, four plus or minus root two. Let me just redo that. Um, I get x equals four plus or minus root two. So remember, they come in groups. So what you want to do is you kind of want to work backwards. So this time I'm starting with the ending. I'm telling you the solutions. I want you to find the, I want you to find the polynomial that created those. So this is how I do it. So first, the real ones are fairly easy. So you think to yourself, okay, if I have x equals negative five, what factor did I solve to get to that? Well, it's basically you're adding five to both sides. You're working backwards. So the factor I solved to get to that was x plus five. For this one, I want you to kind of work backwards on this. So think about what, what step came first. What one came right before it? So if you were solving this, this was like your end result you did right before it was you probably added four to both sides, right? So that's how you got this four over here. Okay, great. How did you get this plus or minus? The only way to get a plus or minus is to square root both sides. So you had to square root. So what did I, what do I square root to get to X minus four? Well, I had a square root X minus four squared. And then what do I square root to get to root two? Two. So again, think about what I did here. If I solved this, I would square root both sides. I have to get this step here. So if I square rooted x minus 4 squared, I get x minus 4. If I square root 2, I get plus or minus root 2. Now I am going to um, foil this out, and I'm going to subtract 2. So I'm going to set this equal to 0. I'm basically just trying to figure out what, did I, like, what polynomial did I start with. We're kind of in standard form here. So I'm going to do x squared minus 8x plus 16 minus 2. Um, and then I get that. So now I say, okay, it says write a polynomial function of least degree that has rational coefficients, a leading coefficient of 1, and zeros. So I have my quadratic part and I have my linear part. Let me change colors here. So now I have 
here's my, um, my original factor over here, right? And now I have my quadratic factor. Now I'm going to go ahead and distribute this. So I get x cubed plus 5x squared minus 8x squared minus 40x plus 14x plus 70. And so then my final answer is f of x equals, let's combine some like terms, so I get x cubed minus 3x squared minus 26x plus 70. So this is the cubic function that produces zeros of negative 5 and then 4 plus and minus root 2. So again, obviously that's a, a little bit of a process. So I would encourage you to practice some problems like this, and you can kind of even make up your own, to be honest with you, or, or start with a function that you already know and look at the zeros and see if you can kind of get back to it. So basically what I did is I worked backwards on this one. All right. Let's go ahead and um, I'm going to show you number 14. So number 14 says use the information you have to answer the questions. What are the real zeros? So remember, a real zero is anytime the graph touches the x-axis. So in this case, anytime it touches the x-axis is here and here. So it looks like negative... This is negative 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, negative 6. So x equals negative 6. And then it looks like x equals 0. But at x equals 0, there's a double because it's bouncing. So I'm going to put a d there. Write an equation for a cubic function in factored form. So let's write g of x. So how do I write x minus 6 as a factor? Well, I write it as x plus 6. How do I write x as a factor? Well, in order for x minus 0, it would just be x. But because it's a double, I need to have a squared on it. Um, watch your leading coefficients. So this end behavior is down then up, which means my leading coefficient is positive, so that's good. And the only other thing I'm going to do here is, um, actually it asked, never mind, it asked for it in factored form, so this is the format I'm going to leave it in. If it asked it in standard form, then you would go ahead and um, expand that out. All right, I know this video is getting a little long and I apologize, you can always kind of take a break. Um, I'm gonna do 4.6 as well because it's all kind of connected. And so I'm just kind of going through more examples. So in 4.6, what we're looking at, and I'm on page 105. In 4.6, I'm gonna go through three or four examples here. Um, but these ones are going to be having answers that are imaginary. So these are a little bit more complex. Same general idea, just a little bit more complex because we're talking about imaginary solutions. So let me go over number one. So look at one, two, three, four, five terms. So again, I don't have a way to, to solve that. So I'm going to go to my graphing calculator and I'm going to type in this function. Okay, and then what you want to do is you look at your table. Again, you can look at your graph if you want, but I'm going to look at my table. Um, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down and see what I can find for x-intercepts. Oop, I found one. There's negative 2, 0. I'm just going to write that on the side. Let's see if I can find anything else. Oh, there's another one. There's 3, 0. And it doesn't look like there's going to be any others. All right, so I found two zeros from my table. Remember, anytime you find a zero from your table, those are like those are two solutions. So I need to find two more solutions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this cortic, because it's a fourth degree polynomial, and I'm going to divide it using synthetic division, but I'm going to divide it twice. I'm going to use the first zero first. So I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm just going to use synthetic division and put all my coefficients up there. So I get 10, that's 16. Oops, I did that wrong. x to the fourth, x cubed, x squared, x. Okay. Nope, I did that right. All right, so that's negative 32. So that's 30, negative 30, and that gives me positive 60. Remember, your remainder has to be zero because that was a x-intercept. All right, so I use the x, I use the negative two um, solution. Now what I'm going to do is I, so I have, this is a cubic, right? So I factored this quartic. 
And now I have, this is 1x cubed, this is x squared term, this is the x, and this is the constant term. But I want to factor it again because I have another 0. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to put the 3 over here, and I'm going to go ahead and factor this cubic. So I'm just going to take those numbers that I just found. Basically, I'm factoring this twice. Remember, you should also get 0 as well because, again, that was, a, that was a, a, an x-intercept. So now I took this quartic, I factored, out, I, took, I factored it once and got a cubic. I took the other 0. And remember, you're taking this one and factoring it again. So I'm taking that cubic, factoring it again, getting a quadratic. So now this answer here is a quadratic. So I have x squared minus 2x plus 10. Do we have a way to solve a quadratic? And the answer is, of course we do. We could use quadratic formula or we could factor. Um, I'm looking at this and there's no way that this is going to factor because I can't think of numbers that multiply together to give me to add to give me negative 2. So I'm going to go ahead and use the quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So I get 2 plus or minus, and this time I get negative 36. So I get 2 plus or minus 6i. So these are uh, imaginary. And now let's go ahead and reduce this. So you have to divide both things by 2. So that gives me 1. And 6i divided by 2 gives me plus or minus 3i. So there are two solutions. Those are imaginary. And my two real solutions that I found from my table. So that accounts for all four solutions. And basically, that's how you're going to solve all of these. You're going to find as many real zeros from your table as possible. You're going to use synthetic division. So if you have two zeros, you're going to do synthetic division twice. If you have one zero, you do synthetic division once. Ultimately, your goal is to get this down to a quadratic, where you can use either the quadratic formula or factoring to solve it. And then you want to finish solving this problem. Um, I want to do one more on this page, just for sake of time. Um, let's do number seven. So this was like that last problem we did where we wrote the equation given the zero. So we're working backwards here. So what I want to tell you is that I get x to equal 8, x to equal 3, and x equals negative i. But remember, i does not come in groups. It has to come in groups of two. So it's plus and minus i. So the factor that produced x equals 8 was x minus 8. The factor that produced x equals 3 is x minus 3. And then for this one, what I do is I kind of work backwards. And I say, okay, how did I get the plus and minus? Well, I square rooted both sides. So I'm going to square that. And then in order to get plus or minus i, I had to square root a negative 1. So again, if I square root x squared, I get x. If I square root negative 1, I get plus or minus i. So then this becomes x squared plus 1. So now I have this as a factor, and then I have these two factors, and let's put them all together and distribute. So x minus 8, x minus 3, and then x squared plus 1. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of distribute all of that out. Um, and I'm going to get x minus 8, and if I distribute this out, I get x cubed plus x minus 3x squared minus 3. Now I'm going to distribute again. I'm just going to kind of write it over here. I get x to the fourth plus x squared minus 3x cubed minus 3x minus 8x cubed minus 8x plus 24x squared plus 24. So all I did is distribute the x minus 8 through here. and just is rather long. Finally, all you're going to do, you're going to write it as a function. I'm going to choose h of x, and you are going to combine some like terms. So I get x to the fourth minus 11x cubed plus 25x squared minus 11x plus 24. So this lovely polynomial here is what I would solve to get 8, 3, and plus and minus i as my solutions. 
All right, so um, four six I know is kind of short and I didn't go through a ton of examples because basically it's the same thing as what we did in four five. It's just a lot of time you're, you're and then four six your answers are imaginary. But again, I would encourage you to practice this, practice this stuff on big ideas. This is especially important sections, four five and four six. So please make sure you are doing some work on your own and coming with questions. All right, bye for now.